Jill on Good News. It's the talking and visual newspaper with a difference. History is always something to get excited about. It not only tells us about the past and past characters, but it also tells us something about who we are today. I live in Cruden Bay, Aberdeenshire, and one of my passions has been of Slane's Castle. In a minute, the talking newspaper will flick back a great number of centuries and unfold the mysteries of Slane's Castle and the part it plays in Scottish history. A visitor to Cruden Bay today, all the way from London. Could I get you to introduce who you are? Uh, my name is Alan Hay and I'm the archivist of the Clan Hay Society. Uh, and I've come to talk about uh, the, the Castle of Slains as we know it and see it today. It began its life in 1597 when the Earl of Errol, who was the big noise around here at the time, the chief of Clan Hay, fell foul of the king by taking part in a Catholic rebellion against the established order in 1594. His castle four miles to the south, which is actually in the parish of Slains, was blown up on the king's orders and he was sent into exile. So when he came back in 1597, uh, he found his old castle was beyond repair and he had a small tower uh, on the coast four miles to the north at a place called Bowness. And that is where he decided to expand and to build his new seat, which is the site of the place that we now know as Slane's Castle, which of course, as we all know, local to Cruden Bay, isn't actually in Slane's at all. So he expanded his, his small tower into quite a big tower, a big L-plan tower, of which you can still see the bare bones, particularly in the square tower as it heads down into this, uh, down the cliffs and into the sea. And that was in 1597. It remained pretty much in that condition. His son the, and successor, the 10th Earl of Errol, uh, based himself at Errol uh, in Perthshire. He didn't uh, really base himself here in Aberdeenshire. But in 1636, on his death, uh, Errol had to be sold because that particular Earl had run up enormous debts, which had to be uh, uh, settled one way or the other on his death. And the, and the Errol property was sold to Sir Patrick Ogilvy of Ochterhouse. So, so thereafter, Slane's Castle, uh, where we are now, uh, became the, the sole seat of the family. The 11th Earl of Errol, Gilbert, famous name in Hay history, going right back to the 12th century, uh, Gilbert uh, uh, added to the property in 1664, where he took the two wings of his grandfather's L plan and expanded it into, as it was the fashion of the time, into a courtyard palace, four sides of a courtyard palace. Uh, and that really is where we start to see, or you can start to recognise, the building that we, uh, the, the ruin that we see today. It remained pretty much in that condition. Various alterations were made. The 12th Earl of Errol, who was a cousin of the 11th, uh, added a new frontage, a very grand uh, 18th century frontage, very early in the 18th century. Uh, and it remained in that condition pretty much until the succession of the 18th Earl, uh, William George, uh, which was in 1819. Uh, he was an extravagant fellow, his, as were his father and his uncle, his two predecessors. They uh, disposed of enormous areas of land around here uh, between roughly 1780 and, and 1820. Um, not to invest in anything else like the Industrial Revolution, but really just to provide themselves with cash for conspicuous consumption. So they depleted the uh, fortunes of the family very severely during those years. Uh, so William George didn't have a great deal to inherit, but he had a very good conceit of himself. Uh, he thought the world owed him a living and that he was entitled to the status that he'd inherited. Um, so he proceeded to damage things a little bit further. He spent very lavishly on 
George IV's visit to Edinburgh in 1822 in his capacity as hereditary Lord High Constable of Scotland. Uh, and then uh, a few years later, he, he, uh, he rebuilt Slane's Castle very substantially at enormous expense. Uh, he had, of course, made a very grand marriage to Elizabeth Fitzclarence, who was an illegitimate daughter of the king. Who were all of those, his, his ten children, were married into the, the, the senior end of the nobility. And he needed a house, he felt, to reflect his status. So the old, uh, rather rough uh, courtyard of his predecessor, the 11th Earl, was um, substantially remodelled and clad in peterhead granite. Uh, and that is substantially the building that we see today. He, uh, he, he, he wanted to make the, the place as, uh, as grand looking as it possibly could, for example, although it was beyond his budget, which is why, for example, we get the, uh, the, the stable block which is at the north end of the, the very north end of the property, incorporated into the house because it looks better from a distance. That, uh, that, that building continued in use. His son, the, the William Harry, the 19th Earl, uh, was, was a very benevolent laird. He, was, he, he held the title for nearly half a century. Uh, and he, again, he spent lavishly. He, he built the new harbour at Cruden Bay, he built the Congregational Kirk, he, he opened a reading room. Uh, he, he did all kinds of things for the community, which was all to his credit, but of course it wasn't, um, it, it wasn't anything that the estate could necessarily afford, which was shrinking all the time. And by the time his son, who was the 20th Earl, succeeded, which was in 1891, uh, the, the, uh, the fortunes were really, uh, they, were, they were really beginning to struggle. Uh, by 1916, the First World War brought, brought in the twin evils of inflation and taxation, which they had never had to deal with before. And by, by 1916, it was no longer affordable and it was disposed of to a Glasgow ship owner called Sir John Ellerman, uh, who, was, who bought it purely as an investment opportunity, and, um, and didn't, he never even actually visited the, the, the place. The, the farms, there were, two, uh, there, were, there were something like 28 tenants at the time, I think. Uh, the farms were sold mainly to the tenants. Ellerman then sold the castle again uh, with, in, in less than 10 years, uh, to a company that essentially demolished it or began to demolish it. They started tearing it apart uh, to, to sell, uh, asset strip, I suppose, uh, for the architectural salvage. So the cornices, the fireplaces, everything else that, um, that, that, that could be sold was, was pulled off and sold off. And that is why we are left with so little of, of, of this magnificent building today. So we're now going to look at the the, the, the picture of uh, of the castle on the wall here. There are various bits of the interior uh, of the of this building still uh, in the present Earl's house at Old Slains, four miles south, that are incorporated into the walls there. But there's very little of it that actually survives, of course, of the inside of it. But just to give a picture of what this building, constructed by William George, the 18th Earl, out of the old castle of his ancestors in 1836 to 37, might have been like at the time. It's interesting to note that the castle is only two storeys high and it was the entrance was at first floor level. So all of the public rooms were on one floor and that was the first floor. No great staircases. No, so, the grand entrances down down staircases everything was on the on a single story level and the ground floor was very large not entirely but very largely given over to domestic offices so that the the front door is here this is the main entrance and you have the the ru ruins here of where the staircase 
would have would have extended downwards. Those steps, incidentally, very highly dressed at granite, are now installed at the Music Hall in Aberdeen. These are the external steps for, for, from the, running up to the front door at Slane. So here we have the front door. Immediately to the left of the front door, that room, and remember we're, we're working here at first floor level, immediately left to the left of the front door is the billiard room. And to the right of the front door, extending right across into this corner square tower here, which is part of the the very old building dating from the 1590s, R extending right across here were family bedrooms. Uh, they were screened from the front door by stained glass partitions. The, the Earl that uh, probably did the most for Cruden Bay, William Harry, the 19th Earl, unlike his father and his son, William Harry actually lived here. He didn't base himself in London. I mean, he did attend the House of Lords, but London wasn't his home. He, he actually lived at Slane's and, uh, uh, and, and did a great deal for the community around Cruden Bay. And his bedroom was at the top of the uh, square tower. Quite a small room if you actually climb the staircase, which of course you can, can climb the spiral staircase in the, in the round tower that's attached to it. The tower. Yay. With care. Uh, but he, he slept in that room and he had a bath in that room. And he had uh, a servant, a personal servant he kept called Sandy Crookshank who um, had what would now be called learning difficulties, but in those days it was known as the Laird's Fool. And one of Sandy Crookshank's jobs was because William Harry liked to have a bath in seawater every morning, was to crank a pump down on the cliffs to fill the Earl's bath right up on the top room. And sometimes that took Sandy longer than it should have done because some of the maids who knew what he was doing and were a bit ill tricket. Uh, used to take the plug out of the bath. So the poor chap was left wondering why he was cranking this pump and it, the bath was never full, never filling. Uh, so there was the Earl's uh, bedroom up there. This is the man who built the harbour and the congregational church and the, uh, uh, the reading room and a number of other things in the village. And behind that, we are, we are following really the, the, the four, four sides of a, of a courtyard, a very tiny courtyard, um, but behind that is, uh, and this, you can see this in the, the remains here of this, what was an enormous bay window. Facing right onto the sea. And that was the drawing room. The drawing room of the castle was a magnificent apartment. It measured 42 feet by 26. and contained many of the, 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 the best artefacts that the family possessed, including portraits by Sir Joshua Reynolds of the 15th Earl, for example, but also Sir Peter Lely, um, Gainsborough, and a number of the, the, the other really, really top end of their game painters. Um, but beyond that is Lady Errol's sitting room, and then we turn a corner and we, uh, we, we, and, and we proceed into, there's a, there is a bay window also facing north, which can't be seen on the picture, but faces away from, uh, away from the picture here, which is where the library was. And the library of Slane's Castle at one stage was, 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 was very, very well known. It was based around the library of Bishop William, uh, James Drummond, who lived with the 12th Earl and his wife, uh, after, well, during the killing times of the 16, 1680s, 90s. Uh, and he left his library, uh, his 17th century library, to, uh, to the, the then Earl. The 15th Earl was a great book collector. Whether he read them was another matter, but what he liked to do was collect them. And the, the library grew and grew, to, and it was actually double height. The library extended right down to the ground floor. The library, as was sold in 1916 by the 20th Earl, uh, doesn't really reflect that. 
mainly because one of the, the usually when country houses are broken up or when, when families that own them start to feel the pinch, the first thing to go is books. If you sell land, you're selling your income. If you sell pictures off the walls, people notice, or furniture. Uh, but books, all you have to do is fill the sh shelf space with something cheaper. So the library that was sold in 1916 went to the City of Glasgow Museum. They got three pounds for it. And uh, a, a, a well-known librarian has said to me um, once before they were actually lucky to get anybody to house it. But it is interesting, there are, you know, the, the, particularly the 17th century books of, of Bishop Drummond are you know, a good, good example of a, of a working clergyman's library of the time. So the library faced north, and next to the library is the dining room. Uh, really today just an open shell, which uh, uh, conveniently, or uh, quite deliberately I suppose, uh, connected immediately to the kitchen. Looking at the other side, the landward side of the uh, of the castle, uh, the the buildings beyond the round tower here, which is a little stair tower, which also contained lavatories and uh, it had various other kind of the storage facilities, and that, the, the buildings, the, the rooms beyond here, were the day nursery, the night nursery, and the schoolroom, and then beyond that you get the butler's house. If you look at the west elevation of the castle back in the day when it was all standing, you can see actually quite distinctly a, a two-storey house incorporated into it, which, which was the, the butler's accommodation. Downstairs on the ground floor, very largely domestic offices of the estate and the castle itself, servants' halls, housekeepers' rooms, but also um, uh, quite a number of guest bedrooms uh, and, uh, uh, and a smoking room where the gentlemen would retire to smoke and drink cigar, uh, drink, drink, drink cigars, <laughs> drink, 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 drink brandy and smoke cigars <laughs> after, uh, after dinner. That was on the ground floor accessed by a staircase <clears throat> heading downwards from the back of the building. Um, and uh, beyond, beyond the whole structure, as just described, which, which is you know, very evident, evident today, was the square stable yard, which included stables, a, a, a carriage house and at one point a bakery and a brewery which were which were which were all part of the castle complex so that's the castle as we see it now well alan i'm gobsmacked i usually have a bit of uh, i usually have a wee bit to say in these interviews but in this occasion i haven't had nothing to say because alan you, you've just given us you know, a great insight, not only to this lovely building that is left standing, but how it used to be. You know, well, the great castle of Slane's Castle and a wee bit about the history of the, this place. Um, OK, so here we've got a picture of the castle as it was in its heyday, which uh, it looks clearly very, very different to what we see today. Uh, there's a couple of things to, to add to, to, to what I've said is that... Um, this is proper green house building nearly 200 years ago, but John Smith uh, of Aberdeen, who was the architect who reconstructed the building for the 18th Earl, uh, ensured that the water supply for the castle was, uh, the castle was, water was supplied by cisterns on the roof. It was supplied by rainwater. And right in the middle of the building is a room called the saloon, which is often described in very grand terms in anything that you read uh, today. It was an octagonal room the main apartments of the castle opened off it or down corridors that came off the saloon, which was very much the centrepiece of the castle. But it's not the case that they held balls and great receptions in that room, it, 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 and as is quite evident from the fact that if you, if you walk into the remains of it in the ruin now, it's actually not very big. Um, the chimneys, you can get the, the impression of these very tall chimney stacks. Not for nothing was John Smith known as Tudor Johnny. Uh, and the corner of the castle goes right down into a gully uh, that, uh, lapped by the waves. Uh, there is a story told of one of the butlers when he was drunk. Uh, getting back into William Harry's day, somebody bet him he couldn't walk around the castle. Uh, 
um, and he decided that he would walk a full circuit of the castle until he came to that corner uh, where very regrettably he found that he couldn't and the poor man died. Uh, anything else? So the picture here gives you a, an impression of the grandeur of the place that was constructed not only by William George but of his predecessors, but was, which was brought up to date, up to 19th century date, in very splendid order in the 1836-1837. It was the seat of a family of very great significance in our past, uh, dating right back to the 12th century. But family that has been Lord High Constable of Scotland, second only to the members of the royal family in terms of precedence since 1308. Um, uh, they've entertained kings and princes and prime ministers here. Um, and uh, the, 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 this is a building of national significance, not just local significance, which we really should take pride in and, uh, and try and preserve. We, we'll never get it back the way it is, or the way it was, the way that picture portrays it, uh, but we can recall what it meant and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and something of the great deeds that happened here. Alan, you really brought a tear to my eye as a local person who over the last 20 years and more who have walked up to that castle day in day out wondered what went on there who was there you've really brought it to light anyway thank you very much we're going to have you back alan to cruden bay i know it's a long way to come from london but we'll get you back uh, with more of your enthusiasm of the history of cruden bay and the Clare clan hay we're going to get you to talk about that in a, a later date, Alan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank really you. It doesn't stop at this ruin up there, does it? it doesn't uh, no, it doesn't. I mean, it's the family. About people. The, the, yeah. It's about people, and the family yeah. continues to this day. Uh -huh. uh, so we will be following this up, or you, Jill, will be following this up at some point, with, uh, but with a, an interview with the present Earl of Errol, who is the twenty fourth, uh, the, uh, the great great grandson of the Earl who sold Slains in nineteen sixteen. Uh, and uh, he he remains very interested in the history of the family. He's a great uh, a, a supporter, a great a, a active supporter, a active chief of, of the clan Hay, and he will be very excited about speaking to you about uh, about uh, his, his role today. And all the people of Cruden Bay and wider Indeed. field. Yes, that's it. Indeed. That yeah. absolutely super. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.